Um, thank you for joining us either in person or on Zoom. Um, my name is Dr. Chrissy Mogren. Um, I'm a recent hire in the PEPS department um, in CTAR. Um, I am an entomologist and my focus is specifically on pollinator ecology. And today I'm gonna be giving you a little bit of background information on um, bees here in Hawaii, um, pollination services, as well as um, just some things to keep in mind, you know, as we're you know, talking to members of the general public, specifically with regards to pollination services and ways that we can um, conserve bees here in Hawaii. But before we do that, the first thing we need to do is have a candid discussion about bees in Hawaii. So a lot of times when we're talking about our national pollinator initiatives and some of the things that we can be doing to conserve pollinators on a nationwide basis, what we're really talking about are solitary bees as well as honeybees. But here in Hawaii, um, many of the solitary bees that we would be conserving in our home garden systems are actually introduced. They are not native and neither are honeybees. Um, they were first introduced in 1857 to the state. Um, they are Apis mellifera, or the European honeybee, and that's where they are native to. Um, these were, you know, once they were introduced, it was pretty clear that they had a really important role to play in the propagation of things like Kiave, um, and had a, you know, really important role with regards to that. So that was really important for the cattle industry. Um, and, you know, they're also very important for crop pollination, for things like macadamia nuts as well as coffee. So certainly, you know, they're introduced, but it is important to keep in mind that we would not have as robust of an agricultural industry in the state if honeybees were not here. Um, with regards to the solitary bees, um, almost, so many of the solitary bees are adventive introductions from the mainland in Asia, and they've um, happened or occurred within the last 150 years. However, we do have um, some native bees here in Hawaii, the native yellow-faced bees, which all belong to the genus Hylaeus. Um, we've got uh, 63 endemic species, maybe upwards of 70, and some of them have actually been listed as federally endangered. Now, for better or worse, we're typically not gonna be encountering these Hylaeus bees within home garden systems or in agricultural areas. Um, so they don't have much value with regards to pollination in these systems, but they are very important for pollination of native and endemic plants here in Hawaii. So those were, that's where their close associations are. So they're more likely to be encountered in their native habitat, so in remnant patches along coastal areas um, and in relatively undisturbed forest systems. Um, so with this map right here is basically showing you our, um, you know, the different islands. So we've got all islands here in the state and, you know, by county showing you how many species are endemic, which means that they don't occur anywhere else except for on those specific islands. So they're, you know, pretty well distributed throughout um, the entire state on many of the different islands and some species, um, you know, will occur on more than one. But many of them, as I mentioned, have very specific habitat associations with specific plants. But as I mentioned, introduced bees are very essential for Hawaiian crop pollination. So we're gonna have things like um, the lily koi or passion fruit. Um, these flowers are actually, they can be pollinated by honeybees, but really the best, most efficient pollinator of this is going to be carpenter bees, which were also introduced um, from the mainland United States. Things like avocado, um, macadamia nuts, as I mentioned, as well as coffee, then also um, other, um, crops such as cucumbers and melons. Cucumbers are especially are really important. So macadamia and coffee are two of the highest um, grossing crops here in the state. But cucumber, interestingly enough, are also the sixth most um, uh, productive or um, sixth most valuable crop here in the state. And the majority of cucumber that we're growing is actually grown for local consumption. Um, in the mainland United States, we actually have what's called a squash bee. Um, they belong to the genus Pepinapis. Um, that's because um, many squash are derived from what's called a buffalo gourd, which is native to the southern United States. Um, you know, and so that's where the pollinator evolved and has this really close association. We do not have that bee here. So what we have to do then is rely upon pollination provided by honeybees specifically. So while they may not necessarily be the most efficient pollinator of squash and cucumber, because there are so many of them, they are able to get the job done in a very efficient manner. Now we've seen um, a drastic shift with regards to agricultural production in the state of Hawaii, um, you know, particularly within the past 30 years. Um, we've seen a very large decline in a lot of the plantation style production. So the sugarcane and pineapple production um, has mostly um, gone away um, within the state. So what that unfortunately has led to is a lot of um, over 200,000 acres of fallow land. 
However, the good news is that this now provides opportunities for different types of diversified cropping systems to be grown within the state. And um, we, what we've seen too in the same amount of time are increases in certain crops like coffee. So an increase of 264% with regards to acreage of coffee production, increase of 50% in macadamia nuts, 126% diversified crops, 31% in tropical fruits. Um, this is really important because many of these systems, they require pollination by honeybees. So, you know, while we're, nest, you know, we're seeing a you know, big shift right now in um, agricultural production within the state, the good news is that it's a shift that's ultimately um, going to increase our reliance upon pollinators, but it means we're also going to um, see more um, crops and cropping systems that are going to be providing resources for honeybees in the state. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that um, honeybees can also interfere with weed control efforts within the state of Hawaii. So while they're really important for crop production, um, they're also gonna be pollinating other plants within the state. So we've got things like strawberry guava, which is an introduced um, weedy tree, um, also rose apple. We know that honeybees are pollinating these and they're big issues in the state and unfortunately, um, they're you know, gonna be propagated by honeybees. We've also got some different types of um, uh, annuals like devil's weed as well as fleabane that were introduced that are also going to be pollinated by honeybees. So it's really important that while you know we recognize that we need to have healthy robust pollinator populations particularly of honeybees in the state um, you know there is a downside to having them here and so you know any efforts that we do to provide forage and habitat for bees in the state also need to be counteracted by making sure that we're doing our due diligence to keep um, weed species under control so that they are also not going to be propagated from a conservation standpoint. Um, now with regards to pollination um, specifically as in the contribution it makes to the state Pollination services are valued at $212 million annually just here in Hawaii. This is a, <laughs> this is a huge number. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, it's going to be largely uh, because of um, coffee, macadamia, and then cucumber production. We also have queen breeding. Queen breeding is a really large industry within the state as well. Um, it is valued at about $10 million annually. Now, this is largely focused on the big island. Um, all of our queens are reared for exports. So about 70% of them are going to Canada and 30% going back to the mainland United States. So this is a very, very important industry. And of course, we have such a wonderful climate here that it's something that can um, occur, you know, relatively on a year-round basis. We've also got specialty honeys, which just this year were valued at $4.1 million. Um, the reason our honey is worth so much more is that we've got many different specialty varieties that we're able to produce here. Things like um, Kiave and then also Ohia Lehua, which you know, are not honeys that can be produced anywhere else in the world. And they can actually retail for about $40 a pound, whereas honey back on the mainland is gonna be largely comprised of clover, and that's going for about $7.57 a pound. So they're, you know, certainly contributing a lot of money annually. Uh, now, if you look at um, the amount, you know, of honey right here, that's what this is showing is just, you know, how productive our honeybees can be within Hawaii. We are ranked first in the nation with regards to the amount of pounds of honey that are produced per colony. So what this graph is showing on um, the up and down y-axis here is the pounds of honey produced per colony. Um, this dotted line right here on the top is showing the average amount of honey that's been produced by honeybees since they first started recording data in 1987. We've got 117 pounds per colony. Now, if you compare this to the national average within the rest of the United States, it's only about 59 pounds per colony. Um, certainly, we have a lot more variation here within the state um, with regards to the rest of the United States. So this is an average of, uh, of all the other states that are producing honey. And you certainly see, um, you know, what you're seeing right here is this decline starting around 2005. Um, this, I'm sure, has been attributed to the introduction of varroa mites. Um, and when that happened, you know, certainly the honeybees here in the state took a huge hit. However, the good news is that this is now rebounding and we are able to start seeing an increase in the amount of honey that we're producing. Now another positive, in addition to, um, from an economic perspective, but also a conservation perspective, um, honeybees may actually be helping to conserve some of our endemic plant species. So for this, I'm using the example of Ohia Lehua and the EEV, so the native pollinator of this important plant. Um, certainly this, the, the bird is declining for a number of reasons. Um, we've got predators attacking it, um, we're seeing habitat loss, um, introduced species displacing it, but it's a very important pollinator of this particular plant. Um, invasive social wasps, however, so let's add another layer to this. We've got invasive social wasps are 
pr or uh, pretty efficient pollinators, but they're very they're also you know subject to eradication as pests because they have a lot of other um, different types of negative consequences when they're present within the environment. So this is a study where the authors um, wanted to see whether or not exclusion of Vespula, so that's the, the type of wasp, um, whether it's present or whether the Vespula had been removed, the effect that this has on pollination of Ohia. So we've got you know, data that was collected before they removed the wasps and then data collected after they um, had removed the wasps. So what this is showing is that in one instance, um, they put bags over flowers so nothing could get to the flowers. So they're looking to see whether or not they had um, an ability to self-pollinate. They put large mesh bags over the flowers, so that's going to allow insects to get inside of there, like honeybees. And then they left them completely open, which would mean that birds would also be allowed to get in there to pollinate. So what we're looking here is when we had no visitors, so that's going to be this, this treatment right here. We've got pre and post removal. You know, we're really not seeing um, a whole lot difference with regards to fruit production. What's really interesting, though, is that, you know, you look at your insect visitors and then all of your visitors, is that honeybees, so when just insects are able to get in, and they did mention that this is mostly honeybees in this particular instance, we see a significant increase in the amount of um, fruit production produced in the Ohialehua. Um, it doesn't increase that much more when birds are allowed to visit, so unfortunately it means that you know, we don't necessarily have um, um, you know, pollination being contributed by the birds, but when honeybees are present, we are still able to see propagation, and they're efficient enough pollinators in the absence of the EEV in order to conserve this particular plant species. So, you know, there's negative, there's positive, there's negative, there's positive. So just lots of important things to keep in mind when we talk about conservation of pollinators here in Hawaii. And certainly I've been focusing on honeybees, but it's important to recognize that there are a number of different insects that play a very important role within pollin or important role in pollination services. So we've got bees. It's not just honeybees, but a lot of, you know, our, our Hylaeus yellow-faced bees. Uh, we've got carpenter bees, leaf cutter bees, um, small carpenter bees, you know, a number of different bee species that have been introduced, all that have an important role to play in pollination. But a number of beetles are also really important pollinators. Um, we've got wasps that are going to play an, uh, a minor but can sometimes be, still be important. Certainly we have our butterflies, we've got the monarch, we have our, um, the kamehameha butterfly, and then a number of flies as well. Um, these are all images here in the lower left corner of what are called surfid flies or flower flies, also hoverflies. Sometimes they get confused and called sweat bees. These are really important to have in your garden because not only are they, are they pollinators as adults, but their larvae are predaceous. And they kind of resemble slugs to an extent. Um, they're going to be on the stems of plants and they just move up and down. They're voracious predators, especially of aphids. So they're great to have around. Um, and these are actually very important pollinators of mangoes. Um, so they're, if you have a mango tree, very important for pest control, but then also for pollination. Okay, so to switch the focus here back to honeybees specifically, we have a number of stressors that are contributing to declines on a nationwide scale, but are also contributing to declines um, or, or you know, inducing stresses here in Hawaii specifically. The first of these are parasites and pathogens. So this image here is showing, you, you see a red dot, that's actually the Varroa mite. Um, it is the largest ectoparasite, so parasite that lives on the outside of a body relative to the size of its host in the entire animal kingdom. So this is huge. This is kind of like the equivalent of maybe like a salad plate sucking the blood out of me. Um, they're huge in relation to the size of the honeybee. Um, these were introduced in around 2007. They were first noticed on Oahu and then in 2008 on the Big Island. Fortunately, the mite is not present on any of the other islands. Um, but they're also able to transmit a number of diseases. And then there's other bacterial and viral infections that can infect honeybees that are having a significant effect on their populations. We've got things like pesticides. These can be pesticides that are sprayed in agricultural areas. These can be things like herbicides that are being used to kill off weeds that are then destroying um, vegetation that bees would otherwise be able to feed on. But in some cases, it's also the pesticides that we're using to treat things like Varroa and other um, pathogens within that, the hives that can also be toxic to bees. So it's pesticides from a number of different areas that can be impacting our populations. As I mentioned, a loss of forage. So whether we are um, removing weeds that are important um, nectar and pollen resources in agricultural areas, or we're choosing to landscape with plants that may not necessarily be high value um, for bees. Um, what we're seeing is just nationwide, even in Hawaii, a loss of suitable forage that's nutritious enough to get the bees through the season. 
then also some of our cultural practices of beekeeping. So um, it's not as much of an issue here in Hawaii, but on the mainland United States, one of the big things is boxing up bees, sending them all the way across the country for pollination services, especially for um, almonds in California, but we've got blueberries up in Michigan, and then a number of the um, curcubits, so watermelon, um, cucumber in the south. This is stressful. Sometimes you turn on the news <laughs> and you'll see a terrible story of how a whole semi truck full of bees, you know, tipped over on I-5 in Washington State or something like that. That's obviously very stressful for the bees too. So, um, you know, some of these cultural practices and also the way we're managing. We manage for pollination is very different when you manage for honey production and it can add some additional stresses to the bees and lead to declines. And I've got arrows here going everywhere because what's really important is that there's not any one thing contributing to declines. All of these are interacting, and some may be more important in um, certain locations than in other locations. All right, so just to real quickly go over um, some of the important aspects of bee reproductive biology, we're going to talk about honeybees specifically, but then also some of our the solitary bees. And this is biology that's going to be um, pretty standard across all of the solitary bees, whether they're introduced or native here in Hawaii. Now in honeybee specifically, we've got three different, we're gonna to refer to as casts. You know, we've got the worker bee um, in the lower left here, which is a female. We have the male, which is also referred to as the drone. So sometimes drone and worker gets in, um, kind of confused as terms, but the drone is specifically referring to the male. And then we have the queen bee, of course, who's also a female. The workers, as their name would suggest, do all of the work within the colony. So they will have different tasks as they develop that will become important. So when they first emerge as an adult, they're not really able to do much of anything. They beg their sisters to feed them. As they age, um, they're going to develop what's called their hypopharyngeal glands, which is a gland in their um, head. And they're able to use this then to feed the larvae. Um, so at this point, they become a nurse bee. So they've not interacted in the environment. They're not likely to have um, encountered any um, pathogens or anything that's not already present inside the hive. So it's a very clean stage of their life. So it's a good time to be caring for the young. Um, as they get a little bit older, they've got wax glands on the underside of their abdomen that'll develop. So for a period of a few days, a single bee will be able to start producing wax to create comb within the colony. And then, you know, as they get older again, um, they'll stop producing wax and then maybe they'll be in charge of cleaning. So they have to clean out all of the cells. Maybe not the best job they do that, then maybe they'll become guard bees and they'll stay towards the entrance of the hive. And it's really only when they're, they're at the end of their lifespan that they're gonna become foragers. At that point, they're you know, somewhat expendable, biologically speaking. So certainly that role is important because they're out harvesting resources to bring back. However, the important jobs inside the colony, they have already performed. Um, the queen bee is the only stage that's gonna be laying eggs. Um, she will mate with, I mean, so when we're talking about honeybees too, we have a domestic animal. Um, in many cases, I mean, they should be considered somewhat like livestock. You know, we're controlling the breeding, we're controlling the genetics of the species. Um, and so queens, when you, know, when you purchase a package, you've got a queen bee. She has been inseminated um, with the semen from multiple males. This is an artificial insemination process. Um, and she will store the sperm then for her entire life cycle, which, or the, her entire lifespan, which will be, you know, approximately two years if you've got a good healthy queen. Um, so she's storing sperm and she'll then make a decision when she lays an egg. If she decides to fertilize that egg, that egg is going to develop into a female. If she decides to not fertilize that egg, it'll develop into a male. So it's kind of a really interesting reproductive life, or, um, reproductive life history strategy here. It also means that a male bee does not have a father, though he does have a grandfather because his mother had a father. So <laughs> wrap your head around that. Um, you know, just like butterflies, their life cycle is egg, the larva, um, the larva grows, they turn into a pupa, and then they emerge as the adult bee. So solitary bees are going to have um, somewhat similar reproductive biology. So it's the same situation where the female decides if she's going to lay a male or a female egg. But the difference in this case is that instead of having thousands, tens of thousands of worker bees working towards a common goal and collecting resources, the female is solitary. So she's doing all of this by herself. Um, this is an example right here of what a leaf cutter, um, nest, leaf cutter bee nest is going to look like. And here's another cartoon image right here. Um, so what leaf cutter bees are going to do is they're going to find holes in wood. So um, in you know, a completely natural setting, they're going to be targeting things like trees that have been killed by beetles and the beetle holes. That's what they're looking for. And that's what they're going to build their nests in. What they'll do is collect leaves and they'll line their nests with these leaves. So kind of like you can see up here in the cartoon image. Then they're gonna go out, they're gonna collect a bunch of pollen, and then they're gonna lay an egg. And then they're gonna start all over again. So this is a very um, energy consuming process. 
Um, so it's only a single female, it's gonna provision her entire nest. So if you're looking at a nesting block like this image here in the lower right hand corner, what you're, these may not necessarily be the same female, so they're colonial in the sense that they'll tolerate one another, but only one female made this entire nest right here. Um, now the males of honeybees, as well as these other um, solitary bees, their role is to reproduce and then die. So um, they do not serve any purpose for um, rearing the young. They also have um, really no value for pollination either. So it's the females that are gonna be doing all the work in that regard. Okay, so now as I talked a little bit about the nurse bees, and they're the ones with these glands that are able to produce a secretion that they then feed to um, the larvae. So when the bees are deciding whether or not to make another queen, so this is part of you know just their general biology, they're gonna make more queens, the colony is gonna swarm when it gets too large, the old queen will depart, and then a new queen will take over. Um, when they're deciding whether or not to make a queen, that's not up to the current queen laying an egg, it's up to the worker bees. And they're gonna feed, um, so all our get fed a substance called royal jelly, and you can think of it a bit like breast milk. So it's being produced in the glands of these nurse bees, it's fed to all bees for a period of about three days, after which time if a, uh, an egg or the larva is gonna become another worker bee, they'll switch it over to a diet of honey and pollen. If it's meant to develop into a queen bee, they'll continue feeding it royal jelly. So um, bee bread though, is a substance that is made by adding um, enzymatic secretions to field collected pollen, and then this is then what's fed to the worker brood. Um, it's also what's fed um, to the nurse bees, this is what she's feeding on to get the protein that she needs to make the royal jelly. Now, if you're looking at this image here, um, it's looking at just kind of the general year-round biology of an entire colony of honeybees. So we can start in the spring. Um, this is where swarming is gonna occur. You're building up your, co your colony population. You're gonna then be able to split and fill, form multiple colonies. Um, during this time, you know, you're storing a lot of honey. You're maybe reducing the number of eggs that you're laying. By the time fall comes around, you're not producing more eggs because the bees, that, the adult bees that are there are the bees that are gonna stick with you throughout the entire winter. And the reason they store honey is so they can get through the entire winter process. Um, they're gonna overwinter then, so they'll maybe make, they'll make a swarm kind of here in the middle of the colony. They do that to conserve heat. They'll eat honey all winter. Um, towards the end of winter, the queen's gonna start laying more eggs so that when spring arrives, these will emerge, we'll have more worker bees, um, and then the life cycle of the entire colony can continue. Now we see something similar here in Hawaii, even though we tend to not have a true winter, we actually have lovely weather year round. Um, but it was um, data collected by another group here, uh, the UH Honeybee Lab. Um, and you know, what they're showing is that honeybee queens, they do kind of stop laying or they definitely reduce um, production. So even though we don't have a true winter here, so it does seem like you know, this bee is native to Europe. Um, there is some type of innate um, cue within the environment that's telling them, yeah, it's, it's nice, but it's still winter. So you know, they do kind of start scaling back production a little bit. So in their natural state, honey and pollen stores, they have to last all winter but opportunistic foraging will still occur on mild days. So if they can get out, they're gonna get out. Um, and again, here in Hawaii, we're gonna see foraging mostly year round as long as resources are available. So um, in order to ensure that we have resources available year round, um, we need to make sure that we have good floral diversity. Um, this can actually be used to predict as well um, what is pollinating a flower to an extent. So honeybees don't see the color red. They don't have the ability to see the color red. They can see ultraviolet, which we cannot see. Um, but bees are gonna be mostly attracted to flowers of the color white and um, purple or blue, and to a lesser extent, extent yellow. Pollinating flies are very drawn to the color yellow. Um, red flowers are, when they're true native state, a red flower, when you encounter that, is gonna be pollinated by a bird. Um, very large open flowers are probably pollinated by bats. So you can kind of, it's a, there's certainly caveats to every rule, but in general, you can look at a flower and then determine what pollinates it. If you have white flowers that have a very long corolla, a very deep corolla, they're only blooming at night, well, it's pollinated by a moth. So um, again, honeybees are, and uh, other bees can be very opportunistic and generalist. So if something's pollinating, maybe they're not an efficient pollinator, but they'll still be able to gather resources from that flower. But we talk about floral diversity, it's um, really important that we talk about not only color, but also um, floral shape. So and the reason for this is that different bees are gonna have different what we call tongue lengths. So you've got things like um, this right here. This is um, a halictid or sweat bee. Um, this uh, you know, would include to some of our, the native Hylaeus bees, they're in a different genus, but they've got these really short tongues. 
Um, then you've got things like bumblebees, which we actually don't have in Hawaii. Carpenter bees, they look like bumblebees, but their tongue length is maybe gonna fall somewhere here in the medium to long category. But you know, these have really, really long tongues. And the reason this is important to keep in mind is that if you've got a tongue like this, you're not gonna be able to feed on a flower like a buckwheat flower that's very open. I mean, you've got this long thing. I mean, that's gonna make it very difficult to feed. So um, for, you know, the alternative is that you've got a really short tongue like this. You're not necessarily gonna be able to feed inside of a very deep corolla flower. So floral shape is really important. Floral di shape diversity in a garden is very important to maximize the diversity of pollinators that are visiting your garden. Now I point this out, and I want to point out here that honeybees fall right here in the middle. They are very generalist, which means that they're actually very efficient at taking advantage of whatever you have available. So, you know, by planting a diversity of flowers to benefit a diversity of solitary bees, you will, by definition, be helping the honeybees because they are um, able to kind of get it, they get a deep flower, then they'll do it. You know, it's shallow, it's not the best, but you know, they'll make it work. So that's an important consideration. Another thing is coordinating bloom times to maximize the availability of floral resources. So, you know, usually <laughs> you're looking at the rest of the country and it's kind of just three humps. You know, you've got spring, summer, and fall. Here in Hawaii, we need to have a little winter hump too. Um, because, you know, obviously we're going to have foraging on a year-round basis. So you want to, within a year, you want to make sure that you've got flowering resources. You know, if you're talking about a home garden, whether this is trees or shrubs, in addition to um, different types of annuals available. But you can also talk about this from a between-year perspective. So you can do things like annuals. So sun hemp is an example of a really good insectary plant. It's going to bring in a lot of pollinators. It's um, a great plant to be used on farms as far as nitrogen fixation goes. Um, you know, but it's an annual, you know, you plant it and it's some, well, I guess here, <laughs> it gets pretty woody and it can last for quite a while, but it is an annual. You know, on the other side of this, you've got things like perennials, so things like hibiscus or a number of flowering trees. Um, you know, so if you're talking about between years, it's important to make sure that you've got both annuals and perennials in your garden. So I moved here from Louisiana. When I first moved to Louisiana, my mom got me a subscription to Southern Living. It's a lovely magazine. Every month they tell you what I need to pull out of my garden and then plant in my garden. <laughs> Look, I work full time. I do not have time for that. So I'm a fan of perennials. Southern Living is a fan of the annuals and this, they may be lovely, but it's important to recognize that both have very important um, value to pollinators. And, you know, if you really enjoy, you know, changing things up, then hey, have more annuals. But by having perennials too, you're ensuring that you have something blooming on a year round basis, particularly as so many of our um, native and naturalized um, trees um, here do to an extent bloom year round. So another thing that you can do is incorporate edible landscaping. This is a win-win. Not only are you providing a resource for the bees, um, but they're visiting those flowers, you know, to get nectar and pollen, but at the same time, when they visit it, we're getting pollination services from that. And so we're able then to get something. So whether you have a community garden plot or if it's something you're able to do in a home garden, even if it's just pots on your patio, um, you know, this is an important way to provide habitat and resources for pollinators. Uh, one thing I want to note is like delicious heirloom vegetables. So it's important if you want to provide resources to bees um, from a home or an edible landscaping perspective for things like tomatoes, peppers, um, it's good to plant heirloom varieties because many of the varieties that we grow commercially have actually been bred to no longer require pollination. And this is from an efficiency perspective. Um, so but by growing heirloom varieties, um, you're ensuring that there may still be a resource and you're more likely to see pollinator visitation. Um, so a number of the different families um, of crops that can be grown in a backyard that provide resources are the Solanaceae. So this is going to be things like tomatoes, tomatillos, potatoes, and eggplant. Um, these require something called buzz pollination, which really only bumblebees can provide, although there are certain other um, solitary bees that may be able to provide this as well. So, you know, maybe less so here, but more so on the mainland, but it's still something you can plant that may draw in pollinators. As I mentioned, the curcubit, so it's going to be things like pumpkin, squash, gourds, our um, cucumbers are gonna be really important resources for honeybees. Um, and the mainland United States, I would say blueberries. We've got something called the Southeastern Blueberry Bee. It is native to the Southern United States where the rabbit eye blueberry is also native to. Um, their life cycle is synced so that they are only an adult flying around for about two weeks when blueberries are blooming. But we also have some native blueberries here in Hawaii as well. So this is gonna provide another opportunity for a resource for bees. But then also some things too, like um, our radish, broccoli, lettuce, cabbage, carrots, onions, herbs, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these other types of annual plants, you can let them bolt. Typically we don't want to, we want to pinch off those flowers so that we get more of the part of the plant that we actually consume. But by allowing a little, you know, one plant or a couple of plants to bolt, um, these are really great resources for bees. And again, if you're planting heirloom varieties, it um, gives you an opportunity to save your seeds on a year to year basis and replant them. 
Um, and just as an example, so um, before I lived in Louisiana, I lived in South Dakota, and I worked for the Agricultural Research Service. And at the time, we had this initiative called um, the People's Garden. It was started by Michelle Obama. It was part of her nutrition initiative. And federal facilities all over the country would um, set aside some land uh, you know, at the facility. Um, employees would donate their time to create a people's garden. And so this was a garden where we were growing um, produce, all of which was then donated to food pantries. And um, what we would do then is also kind of turn into a competition. But this was the garden that we had in South Dakota. So we had a 40 foot by 90 foot um, garden plot, which is you know, pretty decently sized. And in 2014, we produced over 2,100 pounds of produce. Nearly all of this required pollination in order to occur. So that's just an example, too, of how important pollinators can be. I mean, this is 2,100 pounds of produce. This is Brookings, South Dakota. It's not a very large town. All of that got donated to our um, local food pantry. So, um, you know, certainly you can have a big impact even within your own backyard. Um, so it's not all about food, though. So I talked a lot about honeybees. If you want habitat for a honeybee, you put a colony in your backyard, you set up a beehive. But if you want to provide habitat for our, some of our solitary bees, so a number of these, as I mentioned, are inventive. They've been introduced, but they are still going to be very important for providing pollination services in home gardens as well as agricultural areas. And for them, it's really important to be able to provide them with habitat. Um, so we have um, 18 solitary bees that have been introduced to Hawaii. Um, as far as I can tell, with the exception of one, which we're not quite clear on the biology of, the rest of them um, will nest in um, these different types like bamboo structures, or they're going to they're gonna go to holes, some type of hole that they can nest in. Um, this is actually the opposite of what you see on the mainland United States, where we've got about 4,000 species of native bees, 70% um, of them nest in the ground. So what, the ones that happen to be introduced here happen to nest in these stems um, or in um, holes or just, you know, they're more boring um, hole nesters, so, or cavity nesters, I should say, which is great because that's very easy to provide habitat for them. So you can do things like a five-star bee resort. You know, this is a great way to incorporate upcycled materials. You can do broken pots. If you had to cut down a tree, you've got branches available, drill holes into that. And that provides nesting habitat for bees, old bricks. All of this can be utilized by these solitary bees. You can do something more simple like a Motel 6. So you've just got a block, you drill some, drill some holes in it, it's fine. You provide it, they will come. Um, and then also being able to do stem, um, uh, bamboo stems like this. Um, so there's a number of ways that you can do this. I mean, it's a great activity for Keiki. Um, this is an example of what I did in Louisiana. I built a bunch of these um, bee boxes put bamboo in there and then let the kids decorate them. So they got to learn a little bit about bee biology and then they got to decorate their own bee hotel that they then got to take home. Um, so to make these, you know, this is very simple. I just purchased one by eight lumber. Um, I cut four, seven and a quarter inch lengths. I cut one, eight and three quarter inch lengths for the back and then just drilled them together. It was actually quite fun to do. So examples, you know, some of the bees that will especially be seen visiting these are gonna be the leaf cutter bees like I talked about. This is what some of their little um, leaf cells are gonna look like. Um, and you'll know that they've been used too. Um, this is actually a mason bee. So instead of leaves, they're going to um, be putting mud there. Um, as far as I know, we do not have mason bees here. All of ours are going to be leaf cutter bees. Um, but what they're going to do is and you'll know they're used because there'll be a piece of leaf covering the hole. And so what's cool about this is that, so, you know, I mentioned, you know, a bit about their biology where, you know, they decide if they're going to fertilize the egg or not. So what the solitary bees are going to do, they're going to fertilize. If you've got a long stem that they can lay eggs in, they're going to go all the way to the back, and that's where gonna, they're going to lay their female eggs. Because in the solitary bees, the females take longer to develop. They're going to lay their male eggs towards the entrance. So when the males emerge sooner than the females, they're not stepping on their sisters to get all the way out. I mean, that never works out well, right? So, so um, you know, they're going to make that decision then. So it's important, too, that, you know, when you're providing them nesting habitat, some of these stems are longer because the males don't pollinate. When they're deeper, they'll have more female eggs in there, and then you'll end up with more females in your yard that are pollinating. So the males are going to emerge first, and then their role is to just kind of fly around. Once all the sisters in the area start emerging, then they'll mate with them, and then, you know, then they die. So, um, but anyway, you'll know that they're being used because you'll see a bunch of um, leaves plugging the ends. You just leave them there as they are, and you know, probably the next spring, the next year, um, you'll then see that your bees have emerged. Okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit and just briefly give it um, a bit of a discussion on um, pesticides. So you know, we talked about habitat, we talked a little bit about nutrition, um, but pesticides are another area that especially the master gardeners um, can be um, engaged in a really great way to help educate the public on ways um, pesticides can be used safely to benefit pollinators. Um, so one thing I want to mention though is that organic and conventional pesticides 
are harmful to bees. So many people think that if you use something organic, that means it's safe. That's not necessarily the case. Um, so this is just an example. So I went to, you know, a local, this is Home Depot. I just took a picture, like these are the pesticides available. Well, what all is here? Um, this is actually a chart from the Xerces Society for, of organic pesticides specifically. I've highlighted the names of the ones here that are actually found here in Hawaii, or at least that I was able to find here in Honolulu. And you know, this right here on the right is showing that all of these are considered to be highly toxic to bees. Um, you know, what's, you know, so as I mentioned, it's important to note that it's not what you're using, it's how you're using it. Um, that's gonna determine how toxic it is for bees. And so what's really important is to make sure that we're reading labels, whatever it is that we decide to choose to use in our home garden. So the reason we want to um, make sure we're reading the labels is that a product may require dilutions. If you put something out there that's going to be too concentrated, that's going to be um, more toxic or, <laughs> sorry, it's going to be more toxic to bees or could potentially damage or kill your plant. It's important to follow instructions with regards to application timing to reduce non-target effects. So, you know, maybe you're using a conventional pesticide and that, you know, you, it says it's harmful to bees, but it tells you once it's dried, you're okay. So don't spray it in the morning. You know, make sure that you're spraying it in the evening after bees are done flying for the day. That allows the chemical time to dry, um, to kill the pests. And, you know, maybe by the next day too, it's completely um, disintegrated. And so it's no longer present in a toxic form so that bees show up the next day and it's okay. Uh, another thing to consider is that not all chemicals are going to be safe on edible plants. So you make sure that, you know, if you're using this on, in an edible garden, that you're not using something that could potentially harm yourself. Um, and improper application, as I mentioned, could damage plants. And always adhere to application intervals. If you use something and you don't think it killed everything right away, don't spray more. <laughs> First of all, there may be a delay with regards to how quickly the insect or the pest is killed. Um, using more could again damage the plant and um, it's important to note that you know these labels I mean this it's a violation of federal law if you are applying a chemical outside of what it says on these labels um, you know farmers are adhering to this strictly because you know, they have to and sometimes home gardeners don't understand that the same rules that apply to farmers also apply to us on, our, on a much smaller scale so this is an example here of Captain Jack's dead bug. This is um, certified use for organic gardening. I just wanna point out that on the label here it has environmental hazards and it says this product is toxic to bees. It also says that this product is toxic to aquatic invertebrates. So this is an organic pesticide, but it's very toxic to both of these very sensitive groups. So you know, follow the instructions by what they're saying in order to reduce toxicity within the environment in general. So um, here's another one. So this is Bayer Advanced, the three-in-one. And this is the one that has the neonicotinoid pesticide. This is the, the neonicotinoid that you hear about in the news is the pesticide that's killing the bees. Um, yes, it is very toxic to bees, especially when it's being used prophylactically. Um, but for use in a home garden, um, you know, it's important. Like it says right here, it's toxic to bees um, when they're exposed to a direct application. But dried residues on the outside of the product are non-toxic. So treat during non-foraging periods. So again, you know, it's maybe a pesticide that could be really, really bad for bees, but you know, you're applying it following the label and you're gonna reduce toxicity. Uh, one more example here is insecticidal soap. You know, oh, it's soap, right? How harmful could it possibly be? Well, just make sure you're not using it on sweet peas, nasturtiums, or delicate ferns because it's gonna damage your plants. It'll, you know, for the, you know because the nature of how this insecticidal soap works is also gonna be damaging certain plants. So make sure whatever pesticide it is you choose to use, um, you are reading the label that is very, very important to reduce any type of off-target or non-target effects. Or make sure you're not killing the plant that you're trying to save as well. But I also want to make a pitch to you for alternative pest control strategies. So um, the first of these, let's say, well, first of all, okay, let's back up. Monitor your garden. Make sure you actually need to be spraying something or using a product before you just start using it. Um, good old fashioned hand picking is one of my favorites. If you've got a bunch of, you know, caterpillars eating, you know, whatever it is, you know, maybe eating all of your tomatoes, well, they're easy to pick off by hand, you know, so keep that in mind that that's something you can do before, you know, if you, you're on a smaller scale, that is an option. Um, diatomaceous earth is listed as one of the organic control strategies that's also very toxic to bees. I looked that one up because I was like, you've got to be kidding me, right? But no, so the issue is diatomaceous earth is a very, very fine powder. Um, it's actually made of silica. And so the problem is if you put this on flowering plants and the bee is going and collecting pollen, they, that pollen then gets fed to the larvae. Well, this works by, um, you know, if you've got chewing insects on your plants, it's, it like just lacerates the inside of their gut when they consume it. And that's what it's gonna be doing to the honeybees. 
So if you're using diatomaceous earth, just make sure you're not putting it on the, flo the floral parts of plants. Um, but this is great for controlling things like slugs. Um, and as I mentioned, like chewing insects, those, that's what this is gonna be most effective against. Um, you will have to apply it every time it rains <laughs> or the wind blows really hard. So trade winds kick up and all your diatomaceous earth is gone. But I found this to be really effective, at least when I lived in Louisiana, to help keep um, the slugs off of my hydrangeas. Um, another thing you can do is, um, um, well, okay, so again, this is like a catch-22, right? So we got a lot of birds here, especially in Honolulu. None of them are native to here. I was so disappointed when I bought my Birds of Hawaii book because I'm seeing all these cool birds and actually they're all alien species, but they're here. And it's important to note that um, when baby birds are growing, their parents are very, very effective at finding insects within um, your garden. Um, just like us, baby birds need protein to grow. So even if you have, you know, nectar feeding birds or, you know, seed feeding birds, whatever it is, they're collecting insects when they have babies that they're flying back to feed. So providing next nesting structures, so bird houses within your yard, um, to provide habitat for them during the nesting season. I can tell you when I had baby birds, these are um, tufted titmice, again, from my yard in Louisiana. When you have baby birds present, you don't have any pest insects in your tomato plants. That's what I learned. Um, also things, again, we don't have any native reptiles here, but reptiles do eat insects, and that's another pretty cool thing. When I was hand-picking my caterpillars off of my tomatoes, I would turn around and all the anole lizards that were also invasive in Louisiana were just, bloop, they would dart out and they would eat the caterpillar and then they would run back into the shade. So um, the lizards that we have here are also going to be eating insects. Um, you know, choose how you want to provide habitat for them since they are also introduced. But mulching is going to provide habitat for things like um, uh, predaceous insects. So things like beetles, um, especially are going to be really, really great predators in home gardens. We may not see them because maybe they come out to feed at night. It's also going to provide habitat for um, things like wolf spiders, which are also very effective predators. So things we may not necessarily see, but are playing a very important role. And it's also going to help with water conservation too, if you're living in drier parts of the state. And then finally, um, you know, we talked a lot about providing flowers for bees, but providing flowers in your home garden is also going to be benefiting other predaceous insects like wasps. So we have a lot of solitary wasps. They are predaceous. However, um, the adults are going to need to feed on nectar just to get a quick, quick sip of carbohydrates as they're out searching for insects to take back to their nest to feed their young. So these are all really important strategies that can be incorporated into home gardens specifically to hopefully limit the amount of chemical use. But it is important, you know, there are cases where sometimes something gets away from you and all of a sudden you have a lot of pests and you don't want your entire effort put into your garden to go to waste. So, you know, chemicals are there because we need them. Just make sure you're using a chemical appropriate for the pest in your garden, um, also appropriate um, for the plant in your garden that's being impacted. And then just making sure that you're timing your applications correctly to limit non-target um, impacts. So just to summarize, you know, we're talking about building the perfect garden for bees. We're providing habitat for bees. We're providing native plants for bees. So don't necessarily go for the annuals that are, you know, easy to grow. You know, we do have to worry about weed issues, especially because honeybees are so great <laughs> propagating weeds, especially um, that may not be weeds on the mainland, but you know, can be weeds here. So where possible, plant native plants that um, bees may utilize. Um, providing um, you know, pollinator habitat for our um, bees, but also for our good insects, making sure that the plants you're planting are providing nectar and pollen resources. So if your neighbor has a really pretty bush that you've never seen a bee on, it's probably because it doesn't have nectar or pollen resources. So maybe if you want bees in your garden, don't plant that particular one. So make sure that the plants you're putting in actually have resources for bees. Make sure that you've got something blooming year round. If you're talking about our solitary bees, um, make sure that you have habitat available for them as well. It doesn't have to be this grand. It can be very simple, um, and it's still going to be an important resource. And then, as I mentioned, to make sure that we're judiciously using chemicals um, when they are needed. And then, of course, make sure you're keeping weeds under control in your garden, because um, in Hawaii, we need to make sure that you know, we're conserving what's native and keeping out what's not to the best extent possible. So um, one thing that I get a lot of questions about too, so I'll kind of just start wrapping up here, are things about stings. So a lot of people always come up to me and ask about stings, like, oh, I'm really allergic to bees. I'm like, well, are you really? Because, um, you know, and people don't necessarily know what to do about them, especially kids. They get really worried when their kids are around bees and they're worried about, um, you know, potential um, really adverse reaction to happen with that. Well, potentially life-threatening sting allergies occur in a very, very small percentage of the population. Um, so it's about 0.3 to 0.8% of children. So children are a lot less likely to be allergic to bees than an adult, and about 3% of adults. Um, approximately 32% of beekeepers have a severe life-threatening allergy to honeybees, and I myself am actually one of them. 
Um, that reason for this being that this is an allergy that is acquired, it's not inherited. So if your mom's allergic to cats, like my mom is, well, I'm also allergic to cats, but you know, so is my mom and so is my grandma. No one in my family is allergic to bees because I'm the only person that works with bees. And the reason for that is I got stung one too many times. Now, some people can get stung all the time and never develop an allergy. Some people can get stung just like a few times and maybe something weird starts happening for me. I got stung a lot. And then once I got stung and then I, I just knew something really bad was happening and I had to go to the emergency room. Um, this is an allergy that can result in about 40 deaths a year in the United States. However, to put that into context, nut allergies kill about 200 people a year, 100 of them being just from peanuts alone. So peanuts are a lot more deadly than honeybees. So it's important to keep that in mind, you know. Um, now, if we want to know, you know, what stings you, um, you know, and what is it? First of all, a honeybee can only sting you once. The reason being, you know, as you can see in this image, she's going to sting you. Um, she's got these micro barbs in her stinger. So when she stings and then pulls out, the stinger gets left behind because that's where the venom sac is attached to. But they have a pretty, you know, simple digestive tract too. So so, so are their guts. That's all. Everything's attached to that. So they sting and they pull away. Everything has now come out. I mean, they're still alive for a period of time. And so she may continue flying at you and stuff, but she can't hurt you after she stings you once. Um, if you're near a colony, it's important to keep in mind that once they sting you, they can release something called an alarm pheromone. It smells like bananas. <laughs> so if you start smelling bananas near a honeybee hive, you need to get out of there. Because <laughs> what they're going to do is use that to recruit. So they think you are an intruder. You are there and you have done something so bad that they are very, very upset. And they're going to start being defensive to protect their queen, protect all of their larvae and all of their honey too. Um, so, you know, this is a normal behavior in honeybees, so it's important to just be calm whenever you're around them, but it is something to keep in mind. You know, if you get stung near a colony, walk away carefully, slowly, just walk away um, to prevent more from being recruited to you and then stinging you as well. Um, wasps and hornets can actually sting you many, many times because they don't have a barbed stinger. So in each time, you know, they're packing a wallop to a venom. So um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Also just want to put a note here at the bottom. This is provided for information purposes only and is not intended to replace any advice you may be receiving from a medical professional. Um, so these are just my experiences as well. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, so with regards to normal reactions and treatments, it is normal if you get stung by a honeybee to have pain, redness, and localized itching. And that localized itching may last for over a week, and that is normal. You may have mild to moderate swelling around the sting. You may get stung on your hand and your entire arm swells. That sucks, but it's normal. You know, I mean, that's, that's not a severe reaction. Um, you know, when you get stung by a bee, it's like, you just, you know, remove the stinger if it is, in fact, from a honeybee. Um, you're going to want to wash it with soapy water just to make sure you don't get a mild infection from it. Um, if you are, you know, prone to this moderate swelling, you just want to keep it iced and elevated. You can use things like topical corticosteroids and oral antihistamines, and you're going to be just fine. <laughs> you need to seek medical attention if you're in a situation where you've been stung more than 15 times and you start to feel sick, because this can be evidence of something called um, a mass envenomation, which can actually also be life-threatening, although it's not itself an allergic um, reaction. If you start experiencing what's called anaphylaxis, this is when you get stung on your hand, but your head starts to itch, or you get stung on the foot and now you can't breathe. It can also be some, like um, gastrointestinal upset. You start getting really sick. You start having diarrhea. I mean, these are, it's when you get stung in one place, but something totally unrelated, a totally different organ system starts to be affected. In my case, um, it was, I got stung on the pinky and then I started having hives, which I'd never had before. And then the hives started spreading on my arm and then I started getting hives on my other arm. And then my scalp started to itch and all my skin everywhere started getting so itchy, I turned completely red. I had hives all over my body. That's how it manifested for me. Um, and in my case, it was, you know, I had about maybe 10 minutes before it really started developing. So if you're in a situation where something doesn't feel right and it's not normal, it's better to be safe than sorry, but also understand that, again, if you're just swelling a lot and it really itches and it hurts and you want to cry, that's okay. <laughs> that is still normal. <laughs> it's only when it starts going everywhere else, it's like, okay, this something is really bad. And certainly if you have any issues breathing. In my case, I have never had issues with breathing with my anaphylactic response. But if you have any issues with that, seek medical attention immediately. If you have a history of these types of severe reactions, you know, it may be worthwhile um, seeking medical attention. Um, and then also um, an, an EpiPen can be administered. Um, what's very important is that if you are an adult and you have been prescribed an EpiPen, do not use that EpiPen on a child because there are different doses. It's based on your weight and you can actually kill a child if they, they receive too much norepinephrine. So um, if it's not intended for use in children, do not use it on a child. So that's another important thing to keep in mind as well. Um, but this is what an EpiPen looks like. 
Um, they're just something easy. You can stick it in your leg. So every time you get stung, you do not need to receive an EpiPen. Um, the good news is that if you are one of these few people who does actually have one of these severe allergies, um, it is one of the only allergies you can actually be cured of. So you can see an allergist. We have wonderful allergists available here in Honolulu. Um, you receive shots on a weekly basis and you start at a very low concentration of venom and work your way up. And for me, it's been very effective. Since I started this treatment, I have not had to go to the emergency room when I get stung at work, <laughs> which is, can, can be frequent. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. So I want to conclude here by mentioning, just making a pitch for our advanced pollinator training, which is going to be available to the master gardeners starting here in June. Um, currently, an advanced training is available. Um, what we're going to be doing is updating this current curriculum and turning this into an online course. So having 11 online lectures that are going to be um, in a distance learning format. So this is something that master gardeners statewide are going to have access to. So it will not just be relevant here to Oahu. Um, you're going to have to pass a post test in order to earn your advanced training certification. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking about a little bit is that, you know, there won't necessarily be the opportunity for interaction with the course instructor. And so um, the idea of having a monthly Zoom meeting for the master gardeners so that if there are any questions as they're going through the curriculum, it's something that I myself or someone else um, with pollinator experience would be able to answer these questions. Um, when we start getting feedback on these um, as we're rolling them out, if it you know, becomes clear that, okay, you know, part of a presentation is not very clear to people, we have lots of questions, we need to make modifications or maybe upload a second video that explains that portion of the curriculum in a bit more detail um, to clarify. Um, so the timeline for this is we're probably gonna be having monthly releases of lectures. So each of these is gonna be between 20 and 30 minutes. There'll be a post test available and you'd have to pass the test for each module before you can move on to the next part of the curriculum. Um, these releases are gonna be starting in June, 2018. So what this means is that, um, you know, we'll be able to, you know, kind of slowly get going, we'll be able to get receive feedback, make modifications as needed, and then certainly for individuals who are interested in taking um, this curriculum later on, you know, you'll be able to work through at your own pace um, with everything that's already been um, available online. So just quickly for the syllabus, um, what I'm proposing is, um, you know, the presentation that you've seen today is basically an outline of what this curriculum is gonna be. And all of these topics will be gone in much more detail, the detail that is relevant to the master gardeners and pertaining to the types of questions that they may receive from the general public with regards to um, honeybees, beekeeping, as well as um, pollination services and home gardens. So we'll start out with um, you know, the pros and cons of beekeeping in Hawaii. So a little bit more detail again about you know, some of the you know, good and bad things that it means about having honeybees here in Hawaii. Um, talk about, um, you know, pollination biology, um, give, um, you know, much more detailed explanation of the relationships that occur between pollinators and their plants, um, talk about bee reproduction and life cycles. So give a lot more information just on the, the basic biology. Um, we'll have a lecture on the yellow face bees. I myself am not an expert in this. will be Dr. Paul Krishnicki, who is, um, um, uh, works in the PEPS department as well. So he's volunteered and offered to put together a curriculum for that. We'll have um, a lecture on the basics of beekeeping. So this is not something that is intended to, um, you know, give you everything that you need to become a beekeeper. This is going to be just general information in order to help master gardeners field questions that they may receive. Um, this is also going to include information on beekeeping ordinances, which differ by county. So we have information for that as well within that. And talk about, again, stings, but then also some of the other um, aspects of the medical value of honeybees. So talk about how honey can be used for burns, you know, and um, how um, in some cases it's been said that honey can help with asthma symptoms in children. And just, you know, there's a lot of these kind of anecdotal evidence of some of these things, but actually talk about the things that we have scientific evidence of, which in many cases is actually a bit more moderated than what people think um, is actually the reality. So but provide some context for that as well. Um, then talk about pollinator declines in a three-part series. So the first would be about pests and pathogens of honeybees specifically. Um, the second will be on pesticides and again providing more advanced information on um, reading pesticide labels and making sure that you're choosing the right product for your pest problems. And then finally with nutrition, which is an area that my personal research actually overlaps with quite a bit. So looking at the health of floral resources, um, the different nutrients that are received from these and ways that we can kind of enhance this more so in the environment. And then of course, what everybody really wants to know about is pollinator gardening. So we'll kind of, you know, start saving the best for last a little bit <laughs> and talk about, you know, just different aspects of um, pollinator gardening, ways that you can um, choose flowers. Um, in this case, it'll be very specific to Hawaii, ways that you can choose floral resources that are gonna be appropriate 
for our state. And then finally have a lecture on butterflies, um, which will be covered by um, Dr. Will Haynes. I'm also toying around with the idea of including one on kind of DIY projects with bee resources. I tried making a candle and then I couldn't get it to burn. So then I'm like, maybe I'm not the best person to do this, but we'll see. Hopefully we'll be able to put something together. So just ways you can make, you know, just salves, you know, and things. I've made lotions before for friends. Um, it's all stuff you can buy at the grocery store and then add beeswax. And so they're really fun. They're great DIY projects. They're wonderful for gifts, um, wedding party favors, you know, anything. So um, but just provide, you know, just some basic information on ways you can do that. Um, my intent is also to provide extension resources so that there will be um, deliverables available as well. So when questions come in from the public, there'll be a product that you can then um, give to them in addition to your own knowledge that you're able to pass on. Um, now, I understand that in some cases, people may feel like this is an overwhelming amount of information. I promise that it will be delivered to somebody who has a basic Master Gardener background. So you do not need to have a degree in science in order to be able to understand the information I will be giving you. Um, this is, you know, again, it's intended to advance your own knowledge. It's going to provide an opportunity to receive an advanced um, pollinator training certificate. And then also, because we have such a wonderful network of master gardeners throughout the state, um, be able to, you know, provide a really great network and opportunity to disseminate, um, you know, good factually based information about um, pollinators um, in the state. So um, that's what I have for today. Um, and thank you so much for coming and for those who joined us on Zoom. And there's an opportunity for questions and we can take Zoom questions or if there's any, so yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs>
If not, okay, that's fine. Um, if, if there's any follow-up questions, um, please feel free to email me. Um, probably could have included my email address here at the end, but it is, um, so it's C Mogren, so C-M-O-G-R-E-N at hawaii.edu. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you may have about this presentation or in general about bees. If you have ideas on resources that you believe would be beneficial to your stakeholders um, in your particular area, please let me know and I'm happy to work with you to develop those. So, all right. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.